Travels and Traditions with Bert Wolf is a classic travel journal. A record of Bert's search for information about our world and how we fit into it. Bert travels to the source of each story, trying to find the connections between our history and what is happening today. What he discovers can improve our lives and our understanding of the world around us. And of course, there's always Bert's slightly irreverent sense of humor. Uh-oh. Oh. oh, my goodness. We're going to need a bigger can. In part one of this program about chocolate, we discovered that Columbus's son was the first European to see a cacao bean and discover its role as money for the Maya. We heard about chocolate's arrival in Europe, its acceptance by the church, and its reputation as an aphrodisiac. We toured the Italian city of Torino, checked on the shroud, stopped into a 350-year-old chocolate cafe, drank the local chocolate specialty, and hung out with one of the world's leading authorities on chocolate. Here in part two, we'll visit a hacienda in Venezuela to find out how the finest chocolate beans are being saved from extinction, how they are grown and fermented. We'll follow the beans back to Italy and see how they are selected and processed into chocolate bars. And I will attend a professional chocolate tasting class during which I will share with you the secrets of how the pros taste chocolate. These folks actually earn a living tasting chocolate. How come I didn't know that when I was busting my bun in law school? What does Bert want to be when he grows up? If Bert could really pick his job, oh boy. These days, a major problem in farming throughout the world is the reduction in the number of species of a particular plant. The desire to streamline production and reduce cost has led to a reliance on a very limited number of species. Since the 1970s, when scientists started keeping detailed records, we have lost thousands of species. The focus is always on high-yielding single varieties. Industrial farming uses machines to harvest shiploads of a single crop. The trend has resulted in concentrating on the varieties that are most profitable. But they may not be sufficiently resistant to new forms of disease, and particularly to changing climates. In addition, we are losing varieties that often have the best flavors and textures. In South America, the founder and president of Demori, Gianluca Franzioni, experimented with various varieties of cacao beans so he could find out how to preserve the biodiversity of the beans and prevent the extinction of the rarest varieties. And we started to collect uh, uh, different uh, um, cacao tree, uh, I mean, criollo tree varietal, from different area of Venezuela. In 2003, we had our first crop of some criollo materials that we launched in the market. The extinction of variety has become a serious problem in the production of cacao. Some of the finest forms of cacao are getting harder and harder to find. There are about 15,000 varieties of cacao. The high yielding varieties contain astringent phenolic acid, which makes the plant more resistant to parasites. But the acid also makes the cacao less aromatic and bitter. The finest cacao for making chocolate is Criollo. It has an intense aromatic bouquet, a creaminess, and a soft sweetness. Venezuela really has uh, a very uh, huge diversity of uh, criollo beans. What, the, what is criollo beans? Uh, criollo cacao is uh, a very ancient cacao that uh, is uh, very uh, precious, is very rare. 
less than one-tenth of one percent of the world's harvest of cacao beans is Criollo. It's considered to be the finest and the rarest and the most delicate cacao. It also has the most rounded flavor profile. Criollo is an heirloom variety of cacao that can be traced back to the Maya and the Aztecs. Because it's so difficult to cultivate and the yield is so low, most farmers have stopped growing it and the variety was almost lost. Fortunately, there are a few growers in Latin America who are determined to protect and rejuvenate this rare and most delicate cacao bean. John Lucas set up what he calls the Criollo Project. The Hacienda San Jose is really some kind of a, a unique environment where we put uh, some kind of uh, heirloom cacao that it became uh, uh, some uh, international treasure and everybody, I mean chocolate lovers really want to visit the Hacienda because it's the only Hacienda in the world with such a great diversity of Criollo cacao. Demori partnered 50-50 with the Francesi family and established a 450-acre plantation in Venezuela. It's set among the trees that produce mangoes, papaya, and mahogany. But the most interesting undertaking at the Hacienda is the recovery of seven different varieties of Criollo. So happy in 94, I met uh, for the first time the Franceschi family that they have a very large history it's in back uh, to 1830 in cacao uh, trading. And uh, I, let's say, I share with them uh, this dream. And my dream was, uh, you know, uh, get people uh, know the, you know, the, the Criollo potential, get the Criollo flavor. And of course, at that time, it was just a dream. They set up an agreement with cooperatives and private growers to help preserve the biodiversity of these varieties. They make the beans available to chocolate producers throughout the world. They also use these vintage beans to make their own chocolate. Like in every kind of ingredients, you have to start from the farm. So let's say farm and the factory are really uh, combined together to perform uh, the best result. Cacao is an evergreen plant that becomes productive in its third year of life and reaches a maximum productivity around the fifth year. The flowers are produced in clusters directly on the trunk and older branches and are pollinated by teeny flies. The fruit is called the cacao pod. As it ripens, it adopts various colors and shapes. The ripening takes from four to six months, and they are harvested twice a year. The pods are cut in half with a machete. Inside, there are from 20 to 60 seeds called cacao beans. The beans are covered by a sugary white pulp. Once the cacao beans are harvested, they're collected and put inside wooden crates. The crates are held in dark rooms with a high humidity. And you leave the cacao beans inside with, inside with the juice, uh, according to the different uh, varieties, could be three days till seven days uh, to ferment. The low oxygen levels and the low pH levels cause the sugary pulp that covers the beans to start fermenting. The cacao beans become sweet and dark. During that time, the mass is shifted around. The shifting prevents the formation of any mold. It's a crucial step. This is the point where all the potential aroma develops. The acidity and the bitterness of the cacao beans are reduced. It is the technique that determines the final quality of the raw materials that are going to be processed into chocolate. To stabilize the beans and to stop the fermentation process, the beans are dried. The drying process can take up to 15 days, depending on the weather conditions. Usually they're spread out on mats and dried by the sun. If it rains, they're covered and protected from the humidity. When the beans reach a humidity of about 7%, they're collected and packaged inside jute bags. Each bag weighs about 60 kilos. It's 
about 130 pounds. Then they are shipped to Italy for processing. Controlling the entire production process is essential. In 1997, Gianluca returned to Italy to build a little factory just outside Torino. He started making small quantities of chocolate using the Criollo bean. Gianluca calls his company Dimori, which is a reference to a particular monument in Venice, Italy. One of the most spectacular parts of Venice is the Piazza San Marco. In English, it's known as St. Mark's Square. On the eastern side of the square is the Basilica of St. Mark's, and at the top of the basilica is a monument consisting of two moors ringing a bell. In the dialect of Venice, they are known as de more, the two moors. John Luca sees the two dark moors as symbols of the dark beans that produce chocolate and coffee. When the beans arrive in Italy, they are tested all over again. There is a biological analysis to make sure they are in compliance with all the standards and laws. There's a cut test that they use to evaluate the degree of fermentation. When you receive the sample, we need to um, check the fermentation level of the cacao. So it's called a cut test, it's a guillotine. So we put uh, several beans, we close the chamber, and we are using... Ah, this the camera. guillotine. This is the uh, Marie Antoinette model. It's a <laughs> very rare and quite beautiful. I'm always interested in seeing the evolution of technology. In this case, it's the guillotine. The guillotine was developed by Dr. Joseph Guillotine, a French physician, and Tobias Schmidt. Schmidt was a harpsichord maker who contributed the idea of the slanted blade to increase productivity. Because of the guillotine's efficiency, it became very popular during the French Revolution. Nice repurposing of the equipment. So where were we? Once the beans pass all the steps, they are ready for processing into sample chocolate bars. The sample chocolate bars are given to a team of expert tasters who evaluate the results. This scale is used to weigh the testers before and after their tastings. Still in the safe zone. Many years ago, I saw a similar approach to purchasing. It was also here in Italy, and it was conducted by Dr. Ernesto Illi. Ernesto was one of the leading chemists in Italy, and his passion was the science of coffee. He knew that he could make a great cup of espresso, but he wanted to understand the scientific principles that cause the flavor. And he wanted to be able to calibrate those principles so he could produce the same level of excellence every time. Espresso, contrary to regular coffee, is mainly olfaction. Maybe 60% is the nose and only 40% is the taste. In regular coffee, you have 80% taste and only 20% olfaction if the coffee is freshly brewed. So the slightest defect is perceivable. We are trying to understand the complexity of uh, the coffee flavor, which is a cocktail of uh, many hundred components. And not all the components have the same contribution. So we go back to the green coffee beans, and then we hope to be able to correlate this information with the, the genetic structure of the plant. Because if something is in a bean, it has been expressed by a gene that is in the DNA of the plant. We will be able to understand the excellence of a cup by looking to the DNA and saying, oh, the DNA has this and this and this gene that are the genes of the high quality. And so you will have wonderful coffee from the very beginning on the bean. So Dr. Illy built a multi-million dollar lab and figured out how to get the DNA fingerprints from the coffee beans. They still taste test the samples, but now they also make a chemical fingerprint for the beans they like. It's 23andMe for coffee beans. 
When the main shipment arrives, they take another fingerprint of the beans to make sure that the beans they got are the same as the beans they ordered. Dr. Illy was clearly way ahead of his time. Back to the chocolate. John Luca took me on a tour of the small factory. Raw materials, even of the highest quality, is not enough. You need to be present at every stage of production in order to protect the aromatic notes that are naturally present in the best cacao beans. The first step in the production of chocolate from the bean is the cleaning process. As soon as a batch reaches Italy, the beans are placed into a machine that separates them from any uh, inappropriate material. A few minutes of that, and the beans are ready to be roasted. A central element in the roasting of a cacao bean is called the Mallard reaction. It's a chemical reaction between acids and sugars in the bean, and it's what gives brown foods their distinctive flavor. During the Mallard reaction, each food develops hundreds of different flavor compounds. It's named after the French chemist, Louis Camille Mallard, who first described it in 1912. Mallard reaction is very, is very nice because uh, it happens in coffee, it happens in tea roasting, it happens in uh, uh, meat grilling, and uh, it means uh, some kind of formation at the uh, high temperature, the formation of, of some kind of uh, compounds, and uh, in the specific case of cacao, are called pyrazine, and uh, uh, the, are responsible for some kind of uh, caramel notes. After uh, we roast the beans, we use a, a machinery called the winnowing machine in order to shell the beans. And uh, the product that the resulting from the winnowing machine is on one side is the cocoa nibs, and on the other side we have the shell that we are delivering to some local farmers in order to use as fertilizer. That's a very heavy bowl before they're chocolate coated. Yeah. Then the nibs are put into a ball mill. The friction in the mill causes the cacao butter in the nibs to melt. The result is a liquor called cocoa paste. The mixing continues until the chocolate particles end up as teeny bits. Traditionally at this point, the paste undergoes a process called conching, lowers the acidity and can last up to 72 hours. If you start with mass market quality cacao beans, the conching step is essential. If the chocolate maker is working with aromatic and perfectly fermented beans, you can skip the conching process and make the chocolate from something known as the short recipe. Just the cacao, mass, and sugar. No cocoa butter added, no lecithin added, no vanilla added. So a recipe made of two ingredients, cocoa, mass, and sugar. The final step in the process is called tempering. It stabilizes the chocolate at a level of crystallization that results in a shiny surface. Once the tempering is completed, the chocolate is ready to be molded into a bar. We are receiving from the cooling station, so it's already cooled down. As uh, the, the, temp the chocolate is well tempered, you can see there's a decreasing in volume, so there's space in order to, you know, you can just do it this and it's perfect. Ah. After that, we decide how we can, uh, we can pack. It's important to, it's important to share because if they get moody, I'm out of focus for the rest of the program. Ah, but wait, there's more. John Luca is going to give me a tasting class so I know what's really going on, and I'm going to learn the tasting code. Now, for many years, the Russians have been trying to hack this code, but as of this taping, they have failed. We won. <laughs> we won. Yeah. Okay, so what do I need to know? So let's start with the, one of the best Criollo type. We're evaluating 12 different elements. First is color. 
We want a red mahogany or cinnamon color. You gonna smell the bar? No, no defects, no flavors. Break it down. You're gonna chew it a little bit in order to involve all the mouth. Then roundness, a feeling of roundness on the palate. I, I believe body has a great relevance. It's meaning that you are, you know the art of nature and the art of technology. Break it down. Then astringency, a feeling of dryness. If it tastes like unripe fruit, you're dealing with a poor quality bean or one that was improperly fermented. Bitterness, you can taste bitterness right away or as an aftertaste. The beauty of this cacao is, uh, of course, the aroma, but let's say is the, is the, the, wow. the, the smoothness. I mean, the mouth feel is incredible. It's, it's velvet, you know, in your mouth. Creaminess. No Top quality beans produce a chocolate with a smooth, almost buttery creaminess. Acidity. If the beans were of good quality and dried and fermented properly, the acidity should be low. Butterscotch notes, cream notes, nuts, almonds, isn't that? You gonna taste another one? Yeah, I wanna taste them more. Matter of fact, I might wanna eat them more. We're gonna have a small tasting. It's different, it's completely different. Floral is uh, also some kind of banana notes, uh, citrus. Mm. Spices. Flowers, notes of citrus or riper dried fruit. You know, definitely get the citrus. Yeah, it's uh, lighter. Carmel, we're looking for an intense note of toffee. No bitterness. I mean, there's no ashness in your mouth. It's completely smooth. I think I'm doing okay in the chocolate tasting class, but I think I could do better. So I will be spending my summer in a remedial chocolate tasting class. So those two were 70%. 70%. And right now we have the 100%. 100% is, uh, well, actually was invented by us. We decided to create 100% in order to allow people to understand what is the potential of cacao. Please. Cacao flavor, the classic flavor of cocoa powder. And again, this is really... That's pretty intense. It's intense, but you know, it's still smooth. I mean, uh, it, the finish is clean. We spend a lot of time in different counts in order to have uh, the perfect peak. That means uh, great fermentation, full uh, aroma development, low astringency, low bitterness, and uh, great smoothness. This is a lot of material, but they have it in a written form. So I put it on our BurtWolf.com website where you can download it. As you would expect, Demore makes over 100 chocolate-based products, from chocolate bars to cocoa to hot chocolate mix. But one thing I did not expect was a liqueur based on Criollo. This is from Venezuela, eh? Yes, oh. it's Criollo cacao. As Humphrey Bogart used to say, here's looking at you. And I hope you will be looking at us the next time we present Travels and Traditions. I'm Bert Wolf. Salute. Chin -chin. Salute. Ah, uh, but wait, there's more. Whenever we edit one of our programs, we always end up with more good material than we can fit in. Interviews, stories, recipes. So we decided to put them on our website, BurtWolf.com.